Hi, it's Richard here from the OPA Hub website with what I hope is a fairly explanatory video concerning the post that you've just been reading. So in front of me is a very standard interview screen with three inputs on it, one of which is a custom search. And let's execute the custom search and find out a little bit about the JavaScript that's behind it. And that's behind also the third box, the account ID. But let's start with the uh, search. So I have a custom property, of course. And this custom property I'm going to pick up in the JavaScript of the custom search extension. I could use many other custom properties. I'm just using name as an example because you can easily find it in the code. But it could be all sorts of things, of course. So here's the custom JavaScript extension. And really, it's just the same as all the other examples that we've been working with. Uh, the only differences, of course, you can see is the URL is clearly going towards Siebel. And don't try and use this URL because it's already offline in case anyone fancies a try. Um, you can see that it's using the Tomcat port from Siebel uh, application interface. And it's using a standard Siebel business component called account. And it has a, well, essentially a search specification built into it using a like. And the rest of the code is going to concatenate that with the text that the user types into the search box. And then when we retrieve it, uh, we're going to iterate through the data items, which is how the data is structured coming back from Siebel. And we're going to pull off the fields that we specified in the URL, which you can see up a bit higher, namely the name and the location. Remember that in the uh, Oracle Policy Automation search extension, you have to use the text property, even if, uh, in my case, it's called the name. That's why I copy it into the text property right there. Uh, the ID you get automatically anyway. You might have noticed it wasn't in the URL. It's actually part and parcel of what you receive. And then down at the bottom, of course, we will, once we've taken the data and put it into our search box using the text property, I've also populated location and ID, even though those won't be displayed to the user, they are, will be uh, available to me once the user chooses the item from the search list. When the item is selected, the commit fires, and that's when I'm going to update my attributes with the name of the account that you've chosen, the location of the account, and the ID. Coming back to my interview now, what about the account ID? Perhaps I don't want to display the account ID to the end user. I want to capture it, put it in an attribute value, but I don't want the user to see it, even though it's uh, something I've retrieved thanks to the custom search. So in this case, we're going to use a second JavaScript extension, uh, again, using the same basic technique um, to make sure that I'm only executing it on the right control. And this is known as a full custom input. A full custom input uh, extension means you're going to be managing not just the input box, but also the question text itself. So it gives you ultimate control over both how the question looks and how the input box for answering the question looks. So in my case, as a quick and dirty example, I've simply, in the mount, I'm going to make sure that the information selected from the search, notably the ID, is no longer visible to the user. Uh, so this will never show up in the interview, even though the um, search is on the same page. So in the mount, you'll see quite simply that I uh, set display to none. So this particular control will not show up. It'll still be a control. It'll still be on the HTML, and uh, you know I'm not. I'm conscious that this is just a demo. Uh, this is not something I probably do in real life. But uh, it's going to be invisible to the end user, which means we can capture the ID without them seeing it, because it's ugly. Who wants to see an ID? Just make sure that when you're doing a test, that you uh, have different. Uh, custom property values for each of the two controls. The location, of course, is, is going to be visible, and it's, I'm using it to, to make sure that I can see that I'm capturing the data so the location doesn't have any custom properties. So let's debug. Uh, this project doesn't have any rules. It just has a search box. So I'm going to reset now. In my uh, Siebel in environment, I don't have very many records, and they all have very similar names. So um, I don't expect there to be much interest when I do the search. As usual, the console will be showing my output. So I'm going to search for a an account called demo. And as you can see, Siebel has responded with a set of accounts, all of which start with the word demo. I select this one. I populate the location from Siebel. And I've also populated the ID, even though the ID is actually invisible. I'll go to the next page, go to the uh, 
data tab and you'll see that I've populated all three including the ID. So the ID wasn't visible but it has been populated as a normal attribute value. Just in case you're wondering, this is Siebel here and these are my accounts. So if I select this account, you can see at the bottom of the page the name of the account, the location of the account. And if I go to the gear menu here and choose about record, you'll see the account ID. So um, it's actually pulling the data from this particular list of accounts. In the demo, of course, there was no authentication and there was no kind of access control, both of which can be achieved using the Siebel REST API. But this was just Siebel REST API searching in its naked format. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, both of these files should be on the OPA Hub by the time you listen to this, and I will update the template generator so that we have something else in the template generator in the near future. Have fun. Bye-bye. Thank you.